I have a very interesting guest. I'm here with Mike Saraswat, and he is heading up Ecstasy. And you know what I love is he has um, definitely uh, that idea in mind where you know only the ones who are fearless and only the ones who sort of believe that they can actually achieve. And a couple of pointers are to this, right? So he believes in fearless advertising, that actually this approach builds the strong brands. He has a uh, team at Ecstasy um, who work with, you know, CEOs, CMOs, head of marketeers to deliver global brand awareness for their clients. And, you know, there is some very, I would say, big names working with the folks at Ecstasy. Uh, might it be Amazon, Samsung, you know, SumUp, Klarna, I don't even need to go further. There's some pretty impressive names up there. So, Mike, I'm really pleased that you took the time with us today at Pathong Presents, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you for having me on the show. Very good. So maybe tell us in your own words about Ecstasy. What is it all about? Um, Ecstasy is, as you rightly said, a fearless full-service advertising agency. Um, I personally, I think all agencies are very uh, entrepreneur or uh, principle focused and um, I genuinely enjoy um, being responsible partially in some way, helping brands grow, interesting brands grow and reach. Um, and albeit small or big, create, simplify people's lives, um, help them have more fun and uh, I have a very uh, stoic attitude to life and we won't go into that in too much detail but it's uh, I, I think in a very small way if you can help some great companies with great purpose fantastic products um, to actually reach out cut through the noise and we do it through a principle of being fearless fearless both in terms of us coming up with fearless ideas and pushing the brief slightly to the edge and going are you sure you don't want to try this and fearless on the side of the client to go, you know what, I want to take a punt. And uh, many a times, you know, a lot of people think uh, data is the right way. A lot of people think pure creativity is the right way and agencies are polarized. Mm -hmm. I think you cannot do it like that. You know, it's like um, dating, it's like relationship. Even crossing a road is not just a decision of left to right. It's uh, you're making so many subjective choices about danger, proximity, about smell, you know, the whole idea of data and creativity living together. Mm -hmm. I think that's where XC sweet spot is. Very interesting. And I think that really sum summarizes sort of the philosophy also uh, behind, behind that. Um, who would you say are your typical kind of clients? You know, I named a couple, but what would you say is a typical client for XC? Um, the buzzword is challenger. But the funny thing is when we were helping Samsung, um, they were a challenger brand in the air conditioning segment in uh, Europe or particularly North Europe. Um, Amazon, when we were launching their business platform was a challenger in that space. So whether that's FinTech, insurance tech, uh, we now also try to help electronic mobility brands. But they all tend to be brands who have this huge passion for growth, almost an obsession for growth. Um, and who might be, um, there, there are two types. One is either in a sea of sameness, as, as we call it. So, you know, they're in a sea of huge competitive landscape, um, and their product might be very similar to the product of one of their competitors, 10 of their competitors, mm -hmm. um, but they want to stand out. And the other one is where they have to educate the market. And that education piece can be very tricky. So it might be a combination of B2B and B2C. Very few agencies can actually say they can do that. And uh, we never wanted to be that, uh, accidentally happened to, to be doing it. But now we have a beautiful ecosystem of some very smart people across strategy, data, insight, uh, media, creative, um, across, at the moment, very strong across uh, Europe and US. Very good. What would you say those challengers, right? You describe them as the challengers and individuals within that company, sort of the heroes that are pushing the envelope within their companies. How do they actually, you know, get to know about ecstasy? Like what's the journey that they're going through in order to get, you know, aware of what you guys are doing, getting started? Um, that's very interesting. So from a lead gen pure point of view, you know, um, 
and this might help some smaller agencies, even some of the bigger agencies. But our learning process has been very interesting because historically we've been going for 13 years, started in 2007. Histor my background is television and, and, and uh, uh, sort of, uh, series formats, that kind of thing. And so it was easy for us to get into content and um, create premium end of the content. Um, but then we were at crossroads where we realized that we were in rooms and meetings where we needed business analysts. We needed, uh, you know, communication planners. We needed, uh, you know, people where I was feeling, okay, copywriting is fantastic, but here you actually need somebody who understands the business strategy before we bring the creatives in. And I could feel that because as a creator, but also a business person, there was a huge gap in the market. So these kind of people we were trying to reach are not something that you can pick up the phone to. The first three, four years we were trying to do that. Um, we got very good at it. Uh, but I soon realized it wasn't the most efficient way of doing it. So we started doing email, online marketing. But uh, the way at the moment it works is it's just a slightly uh, innovative way of doing it. We, uh, we have our lists of um, people we have spoken to over the last nine, ten years in tons of trade shows around the world. Um, it's like the traditional way of reaching out, but we found some of the most senior people there. And we keep a nurture campaign going with them. We also have a live feed running of um, reinvesting in our own owned content. So I've even started a um, kind of a podcast educational platform called Brave Hustler. And we're also becoming a marketplace for courses. Um, but the whole idea is to reach out to some of the smartest people, very much like yourself. And I am the smart person on your show. So uh, being a pure narcissist. Uh, but uh, the idea is very much to create what can we give back mm -hmm. for that one track, for that one follow, for that one like. Um, and in many ways, it's kind of self-fulfilling because if they follow and engage with it. It's like the fantastic, and you know, a, a lot of people uh, might not, particularly in Europe, might not like the Gary Vee model, but he's, all he's doing is leveraging the dials of the platforms and he gives out his playbook quite openly. And it's just so much work that <laughs> nobody wants to do it. But the idea is if you can show that you can make yourself more visible, yeah. brands want to come to you and say, they want to be more visible. But I must point out that there is a very clear difference between agencies who just work on platforms and make people visible. And I'm a bit of a traditionalist in that way that I want to look at strategy. I just don't want to go gun ho and then let's just activate anything and everything. Um, yes, we will spend millions of pounds, but once we've done the thinking, we won't take months for it, but maybe a few weeks, but we need to know that the decisions we're going to get, put ourselves into are well backed by data and if they don't work then we know what didn't work because the worst thing you can be in is you go into a situation where you know something worked and you don't know why it worked that's the worst thing you can do for yourself as a brand owner as, a, as somebody who's leading a brand it's better to fail and constantly fail because you know what's not working you're measuring oh there's not working you eliminate 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 but the worst thing is oh we, oh, we had a huge success this campaign was terrific why <laughs> And the creative team is saying, oh, because of us. The media team is saying, oh, because of us. There's no real sense of ownership of what really works. Maybe both things work. Anyways, so going back to the point, because there are so many people we can sell to, the market is huge. We're finding people from recruitment, innovation, social media, of course, people who lead brands, um, CEOs, CMOs. I personally am trying to reach out to more CEOs, um, brand leaders. Who have a vision so if i speak to a vp many a times uh my conversation falls flat with them because all they are about is executing the campaign um and, and we've got a very strong team of people uh, across europe and us to do that but to me what's really exciting is not just about your electric vehicle okay how are you going to launch it in london and paris that's not the idea the idea is for me to make something that i can look back at 10 years selfishly I need to know what's your strategy. Otherwise, it's just another car you're selling yep. or it's another e-scooter you're selling. So answer your question, um, to, we have a whole hierarchy of different decision makers that we need to uh, target. And uh, we're trying to go for quality rather than volume. 
-hmm. So we use sales automation, marketing automation. Um, so tools that we can show off to other clients and say, hey, uh, this is what we're doing. Do you want to try a bit of that? Um, but yeah, both B2B and B2C. But we've seen an enormous rise of interest, especially uh, over the last two years. Um, with B2B brands, huge brands, or the ones who are recently funded, who have to communicate as a B2C product. I think the line between the two words blurred. And, and in your experience, right? Like what, what role does your own website play in that journey that you were, were describing? Like, does it, yeah, which role does it take? That's a very good question. So that's a very good question, actually. I won't name some of the, uh, some of the agencies, but uh, some huge agencies. You go on their social media accounts and you see on their Instagram, 100 followers, 200 followers. And, you know, there's no need to have a page. Um, you know, they're not a, particularly a social media agency. But in this day and age when everything is, you know, ne nearly 60% of media fits being spent on digital globally, um, yeah, we do tons of above the line stuff, but we can't dis disregard the amount of money being spent. And they will have 100 followers <laughs> and 200 followers. It's just such a mismatch. And they're actually advising uh, brands how to run social media campaigns. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we, uh, I, I have this analogy that, you, you know, the uh, Simon Sinek's of the world, uh, you know, if you want to go back uh, the great philosophers and leaders, how much, uh, how much do they actually live what they preach? Maybe not, <laughs> maybe not that much, but, um, but what they say is valuable. The way they contextualize it is valuable and it connects with us. So we use it. Yeah? Um, and, and people use it. So coming back to how well we use our website, the answer is not as much. And there is scope to do that. But the reason historically we haven't done it that much is because um, we found there is a way to, especially in the agency world, is slightly different to say acquiring in a B2B, we're a B2B company, but the acquisition of agency clients is very different to say a B2B SaaS client or B2B enterprise client. Um, we don't have very clear features and benefits we can never have that. All we have is people and their profiles. Um, so a lot of agencies don't like thinking of themselves like that, but they are recruitment agencies and sales agencies and uh, all they're selling is profiles. Uh, so are law, law firms and accountancy firms. KPMG, you know, uh, uh, Boston Group, all, all these fantastic companies. All they're putting is some smart people on their project. Mm -hmm. And some, uh, and ninety percent of the time, these smart people are not directly even working for them. So I think there's this big, uh, huge misnomer between uh, expectations and, and and how they're being packaged. But the long and short is the website historically has never been the magnet mm -hmm. for somebody coming in. Mm -hmm. What what we do is, if we run a nurture campaign, we will track how many people on there actually went to the landing page if there was a link from the website built in but because we are not catering to millions of people we're catering to only tens of thousands globally that's a universe is very small mm -hmm. uh, we can very quickly actually make a link okay this company opened in berlin in uh, you know in uh, oslo and opened it in uh, you know i don't know uh, kuala lumpur so we can connect the dots and go okay there'll be only three departments there so they're all liking it and uh, they've opened at different times mm -hmm. and our sales team and sort of um, the first line of um, business development can connect with them. Do you see but, the role? Um, of, well, yeah, that's interesting. Do you see the role of the website changing? Like, do you see, for example, the, the website becoming um, more prominent in lead generation for companies like yours? Um, enormously. I think there is a a tradition that agencies only build landing pages and apps. Uh, for their clients because they made them a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? Uh, running websites is something that businesses do internally um, because it's so complex, little tweaks. How do you charge people for that? Nobody wants to pay for full-time designers and support and all that. So it's better off doing a project, making money, getting out of it. And sometimes that way of thinking also affects the agency themselves. Um, and it, it affects us because we're like, hmm, you know, 
we'd rather spend the bulk of the money on the project of or say if there's an interest created out of the net camera somebody met somebody somewhere uh, or somebody referred us to someone um, and then let's spend the bulk of the money on that pitch and wowing them and sort of going okay these guys are the right people that were the right team and uh, rather than actually running websites and landing pages so answering your question enormous role of how Microsoft, whatever you want to call it, microsites, landing pages, apps, but anything, you need content to get people there. But once they're there, they become your showrooms. And how well your showroom is organized, guides them through the whole thing for them to make uh, an inquiry. For B2B companies, nobody makes a sale. There is no costing on it. Um, you know, whether that's agency world or tech world, whatever. Um, they just need to get grab their attention, yeah. and that's all it is. Many a times they won't even inquire, but when somebody will send that one email after three months, they can refer to uh, a previous communication which they saw spikes their interest. Um, and these are little building blocks because if all we are doing is building trust, we need to layer it, and a landing page and a website can play a huge role. So for the first time. We as an agency um, last year started putting cookies, um, you know, monitoring social media performance, we started running ads. Um, and the funny thing is we do it for other brands, but we never sort of practice what we pe preach for ourselves. Uh, but for the first time, we've now started to do it. And it's, 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 it's interesting, but I think we can get better at it. Um, there is a lot of optimization that can be done. Uh, we're actually at the moment looking um, to bring in a uh, smart digital marketing person who can automate some more processes that we have. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was actually about to ask the last questions on that sort of what would be the flip side? Like, where do you see the biggest room of improvement on the website? Like, you know, what is it that you're looking at in terms of, you know, maybe, I don't know, conversions or, you know, the quality of the leads that you're getting or the experience that you're providing on the page? Where do you see the biggest room for improvement? Um, I, I, I think there is a uh, there are there are two areas. One is more our end, where um, we need to provide more information to clients. Uh, we're not doing that enough. Mm -hmm. They come on the site. They uh, I show a page to somebody. Somebody might think, oh, they're just making content. Some people might think, oh, actually, they're doing uh, branding as well, and so they're thinking they'll design a logo. Some people might actually think, oh, they'll do the full campaign and they've, uh, you know, um, and it's, it's a very confused messaging. So what we do for our clients, going back to practicing what you preach, we need to simplify it, but at the same time, not take the spark of creativity away. Uh, but I think we need more information, not to take away. We need to add more sub pages, micro pages in there so that people can go deeper and it's not deep enough. Um, and we're not testing with deeper pages. So we can, we are very strong in finance and fintech. So why are we not testing um, for pages just designed for banks, just designed for insurance, just designed for, you know, um, micro uh, peer to peer lending. So uh, whatever that might be, I think there is a huge gap there. But I think it's the second point is not just in terms of the lack of content and number of pages is not using data to our advantage. And I find that is my big problem. And maybe I can ask you this question if, if you have answers to this, but in your experience, the problem with tracking a lot of data is then how do you use it? It creates more homework and I hate homework. So how do you make sure that the homework you create uh, you can actually <laughs> deliver on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm biased, obviously, since that's exactly the reason why PathMonk started at the first yeah. place, right? So because a lot of data, a lot of heat maps are sitting around and are, you know, recording videos from website users and showing heat maps. Um, but it's about the action, right? What do you do in real time? So that's what we are fascinated about here in our team. Great. Um, I would love to switch gears a little bit and learn about you personally, right? Uh, it was very, very insightful and very interesting to learn um, about how you're thinking about um, uh, the page there. So I would be curious, 
what type of content do you consume? How do you educate yourself in order to, you know, basically grow every day? Yeah, that, that's, that's also very interesting because um, I, I personally decided to um, have a bigger circle of friends where I am with people where I'm uncomfortable slightly. Um, where it's just not financial, but uh, they're reading more, they are uh, doing more, uh, they're trying more. Um, they have a different perspective, people with very strong polarized thinking, but allowing myself not to go with anyone with what they're saying, but have a, a, a wider pool of uh, information and knowledge. Um, that's important. Uh, with reading, I'm subscribing to a lot of stuff. Everyone sort of uh, makes a joke that uh, I'm subscribed to pretty much everything. So if, if, you, <laughs> if you need access to Wall Street Journal or you need access to you know, premium different uh, sites from even as boring as Nexus, Lexus and things like that, you know, it's, it's a whole spectrum of things. I, I do like to read a lot. I uh, do read a lot. I was never like that, by the way, mind you. So for anyone watching, if they feel you need to be a certain type of person. I might have glasses, but I wasn't always a big reader. Uh, I, uh, I, I was more of a doer, but I have found out that the more I think um, and then do, the more actually this advice that I'm giving, the suggestions I'm making, a little more informed, a little more informed. So, you know, you need to just look at it from so many different angles. It just is like a huge puzzle. And that's why AI is fascinating, right? So we will never be able to do that as humans. Um, you know, I, I love to cook as well. So it's like, how do you make the same stew or the same, you know, um, same sandwich in 10 different ways? And everyone has a different suggestion. But as a human being, I can never do that. Whereas AI might, or Watson might eliminate that very quickly. Um, but yeah, so just uh, subscribing to a lot, reading a lot, um, staying humble, mm -hmm. and knowing that I am going to be wrong nine out of 10 times and having that constant fear at the back of your mind um, makes you vulnerable, but also quite transparent with your senior decision makers. I think there is this big, and that's a corporate problem. They hire visionaries or suddenly from a VP management level, you start becoming a CEO or C level. Now they want you to be a visionary. But when you're at the VP or a, a kind of mid level, they want you to be executing things. Everyone is a visionary, you know, uh, what am I going to cook tonight? That's a vision. You know, any time you think or imagine, what should I wear for this party? You're a visionary. You know, people just confuse the idea by their job title and that affects not the company they run, but also the agencies they bring in, the briefs they write and the work that agencies deliver. I have never thought so deep about that. <laughs> it's a very interesting answer. Um, since we're slowly, unfortunately, coming to an end of the interview, I would love to jump into our rapid fire questions. Are you ready for those? Ready. Very good. What's the last book you read? Well, um, I read uh, from zero to one, but the very last one uh, I have uh, been rereading is uh, Venture Capital. Uh, the book written by Brad Feld. Um, it's, it's an incredible book. I'm very interested because we uh, recommend a lot of work to uh, um, uh, startups and scale-ups. Mm -hmm. And um, it will be disingenuous of us not to know their ecosystem really well. Um, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating book. So I would recommend anyone who's interested in uh, startups and scale-ups. So, Venture Deals is, is an incredible book. Very good. And the two last questions, right? If there would be no boundaries in technology, what would be the one thing you want to have fixed for your company today? Getting the perfect brief. Mm -hmm. And the last one would be, if today would be the very first day you're working on ecstasy, what would be the one advice you would give yourself? Um, build a technology enabled uh, agency rather than an agency that's trying to be patchy with technology. 
everything should be tech based. It'll just save so much money, so much hassle. I can personally see there are so many processes we can automate, uh, not not just in terms of acquisition, but in terms of delivery, uh, even creative processes. But yeah. Mike, I really appreciate that you took the time for being part of Pathform Cuisines okay. today. I want you to give you the very last word. What should somebody be remembering about ecstasy if they would be forgetting everything else that we spoke about in the interview? Uh, ecstasy will be the agency that can help you bridge the gap between both B2B and B2C using fearless um, data and creative uh, driven uh, thinking, uh, which um, a lot of other agencies do so in silos. Good. Thanks for being part of the show. Thank you, Lucas. It was lovely talking to you, mate. And I hope I added value and I wasn't too uh, philosophical. I think that's needed sometimes. <laughs>